Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading and go to the Gospel of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to read verses 13 through 17. Verses 13 through 17 of Matthew chapter 16. We read the verses responsively, as we normally do. We'll begin together on verse 13, and we'll alternate reading till we end together on verse 17. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And let's begin together on verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. Ready? When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture now here this evening. I want to thank you again, Lord, for the good music tonight. It's been a blessing to sing and a blessing to listen to. Thank you for the good testimony this evening. Uh, from the parrocks and Lord we're asking you now to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive your word tonight uh, Lord I pray the special would uh, tune our hearts to you and turn our thoughts to your thoughts and Lord I pray it would capture our attention and we'd not uh, be thinking about other things that would keep us from hearing what the spirit would say to each one of us this evening so bless the special to that end please in Jesus name Amen. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the heaven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the white seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe.
I'm saved forevermore. Oh, come to the Savior, he patiently waits to save by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and save my beloved. Well, if that doesn't bless you, your blessers busted. Amen. That's great. Good singing tonight. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity we have to open your word together. Lord, we pray that you'll open our understanding as we open up your word and uh, help us to grasp the truth tonight. Holy Spirit, uh, have free course here this evening, please. Uh, move up and down our aisles and in and out of the rows and uh, please minister to every single person tonight. Uh, minister to those who may be watching by way of the live stream. And Lord, I pray that your will will be done in each heart and life and will understand the importance of influence in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, the communist government in China commissioned an author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary to China. Their purpose was to distort the facts and present him in a bad light. They wanted to discredit his name and, of course, at the same time, uh, discredit the gospel that he presented. But as the author they had was out doing his research, he was increasingly impressed by the character of Hudson Taylor, and his godly life. And the more people he talked to and the more people he interviewed, the, far, the, the harder he was finding it to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. And eventually, at the risk of losing his life, he laid aside his pen, renounced to his atheism, and received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. That's influence. That's influence even after he's gone. Influence is the effect or impact you have on another person's life. We, one of the things that, um, in one of the principles of RU, I think it's our sinful habits hurt those who follow us. Brother Currington talks about uh, influence that you have in life. And sometimes people think they don't have any influence. But he, he puts it this way. He said, how many of you, he always asks, how many of you think if you died, you'd have a hundred people at your funeral? How many of you think you'd have a hundred people at your funeral if you died today? Huh? Come on. hundred people? The church would be there for you, all right? Keep your hands up, hundred people. How many think you'd have 75 people at your funeral? 75 people. hundred people, keep your hand up. 70, 75? 50? 50 people come to your funeral? How about 25 people at your funeral? Think you'd have 25 people at your funeral? Okay. How about five people at your funeral? Think you'd have five? Okay. How many think you'd have one? Well, you'd be there anyway, okay? So you'd have one, okay? Now, here's the thing. If you can't, if you can't die without influencing 100 or 75 or 50 or 25 or five people, you can't live without influencing at least that many people. Amen? Influence. The effect or the impact that we have on the lives of others. Now, that's, that's, that's generally when uh, Brother Dean was teasing me as I come up tonight. He asked for the scripture, and I had to look on my iPad here to make sure I give him the right scripture. He's kind of trying to put that up on the live stream, and he said, oh, you didn't get the sermon off the Internet, huh? And, um, you know, when I, when I looked at sermons on influence, 
it was all about our influence on somebody else. But what I want to talk to you tonight is about what we allow and who we allow to influence us. Okay? That's the influence. We, we hear things about eat this or drink this or buy this or this is, yeah, I know you have this, but this is new and improved. And so now you need this one. Or you want this one because it's doctor recommended. Or four out of five dentists approve this one, you know. Uh, we have, uh, they, they, they say all kinds of catchphrases like that. Or you get, a, you get a famous athlete to do your commercial. Or you get a famous celebrity to do your commercial. Why are they doing all those things? Because they're trying to influence you to buy their product and why you need to, to spend your money. Radio influences us, television influences us, the internet influences us, social media influences us, movies influence us, music influences us, people influence us. And the question that everybody needs to ask ourselves tonight, themselves, is this, who and what am I going to allow to be an influence in my life? All these things are going to endeavor to influence me. What am I going to allow to influence me? You, your Bible's open to Matthew 16, where we read about Peter. And Peter is with the disciples. Jesus is gathered with them. Notice in verse 13, Jesus asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And of course, different responses. Some say, they, they said, it's different disciples. It doesn't say who answered. But it says, some say, you're John the Baptist. Well, I tell you what, how, what a compliment that is for John the Baptist. That they mixed him up with Jesus. Uh, then they said, well, some think you're Elias. Some think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said, but whom do you say that I am? And then it tells us who speaks up. It's Peter. And Peter speaks up and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus responds to Peter. And notice what Jesus told him. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah, just bar means son of, just means son of Jonah. He said, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I'm sure Peter was very pleased with that commendation. Thought, man, that's that's you know, I, I got it right. And uh, sometimes Peter spoke before he knew he had it right, but this time he had it right. Now, turn in your Bible in Matthew over to Matthew chapter 26. Ten chapters ahead to Matthew 26. Jesus has been arrested. They've led him away to the judgment hall. And we pick up where Peter is during this time as they're beginning to abuse Christ and spit in His face and hit Him. Verse 69 of Matthew 26, the Bible says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And he was gone out into the porch. Another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. After a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely Thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. And he began, then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. It's amazing the contrast here of the one of the disciples that was to speak up and say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And for God, for Jesus to be able to say, Peter, you're, though you're the son of Jonah, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. You didn't learn that from your earthly father. My father revealed that to you. And only ten chapters later, three, less than three years later, he's cursing and swearing and saying, I don't know the man denying him before others and denied him not once not twice three times three times what's the difference how at one point could he say thou art the christ and another point say i don't even know who he is how could he go from uh, letting everyone know and boldly proclaiming he's the son of god to saying i don't know who you're talking about the answer is influence. The answer is influence. The difference was who Peter was allowing to be an influence in his life. In the first instance, he's with the other apostles or disciples that have been chosen by Jesus. He's with others who are following Jesus Christ. He was in church, as it were. He's around other believers. And boy, it was easy for him to say, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God. But when you go to Matthew 26, he's outside in the palace. And he's with the wrong people, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Everything's wrong. He's where he shouldn't have been. And he begins to curse and swear and denies he even knows him. It depends on who he was allowing to influence him at the time. I suppose if that happened to Peter, it could happen to you or me. I want you to think about somebody else. I want you to think about someone else. I want you to think about Lot and Abraham. When Abraham was called to leave Ur of the Chaldees, he took with him his nephew, Lot. And the, now, uh, just as an aside, he shouldn't have. Do you remember what God told Abram? Get up, and he said, you leave your kindred and you leave your family, you leave everybody. Abraham didn't really obey that, did he? He took, and he took them with him. Caused them some trouble later on. And so as they, as they, but as he went with Abram, you know what Lot found out? He was blessed because of Abraham. Lot began to, become quite wealthy himself in cattle and herds and, and, and wealth. And, and, and he was a wealthy man. And one day, there, there were, uh, word came to Abraham that there's a, there's a uh, fight, uh, there's a disagreement, there's arguments going on between the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. Grazing land, watering, or whatever, whatever it may be. And, and Abraham said, hey, uh, there's no way there's going to be fighting between our herdsmen because we're brethren. And it's interesting because the Bible says the Perizzite and the Canaanite dwelt in the land. And what he was saying is, other people are watching. If we don't get along, that's a bad testimony to them. That's a good, good thing for Christians to remember, isn't it? And so he said, we're not going to fight. And you remember the story. He gave him an opportunity to, you, you, you go whatever way you want, and you make the choice, and then I'll go, I'll choose whatever's left. Now, Lot had been blessed because he was under Abraham's influence. But he made a choice that day, didn't he? Where did he choose to go? He pitched his tent toward Sodom. Lot wasn't just making a decision that day. He was making a decision of who was going to influence his life from there on out. And it wasn't going to be Abraham. It was going to be Sodom. And you find out, we know the rest of the story, because we've read the book. And, and he, under the influence of Sodom, he lost his testimony. Under the influence of Sodom, he lost his children. Under the influence of Sodom, he lost his wife. Under the influence of Sodom, he lost his morality and the morality of his daughters. All of that because he made a decision of who was going to influence him in his life. What about the 12 spies when they were sent into the land of Canaan? Ten of them came back and they said, we can't take this place. There's giants there. And, and they're, they're, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And, and they're, they're, there's no way we can do it. Two men, who were they? Joshua and Caleb said, 
If this is what God says we can do, we can do it. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Let's go get it. But the people decided that day we're not going to be influenced by the two. We're going to be influenced by the ten. And they were fearful, and they were afraid, and they said, we're not going in. And consequently, for the next 40 years, they wandered in the circle in the wilderness until all the men, 18 years of age and older, died in the wilderness. All of that 40-year delay, all of that wandering in the wilderness, all of that went on because they decided who was going to influence them. And they made a bad choice. What I'm saying is it's vital who you allow to influence your life. It is absolutely essential that you allow the right people and the right things to be an influence in your life. Now, the natural question would be, then who and what should influence me? What should I have as a believer, as a Christian, to influence my life? Let me give you some, some ideas, all right? Number one, let's let the Holy Spirit of God influence us. Amen. Ephesians 5 and verse 18, most of you know it. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And again, the, the, the comparison there is where you're not, if someone is under the influence, they're driving a car, they can get stopped and picked up for a DUI. Stands for driving under the influence. Driving under the influence of alcohol. And, and a lot of times we, we have different, you know, we have different laws. We have different penalties for people who commit crimes when they're under the influence of alcohol. For instance, it, it may not be, uh, if you're drunk and you kill somebody with your car, it may not be murder, it may just be manslaughter. Because they say you're under the influence. You see, there's different, different laws because they think you're not as responsible for your actions because you're under the influence of the alcohol. But now wait a minute. The Lord says we ought to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Like they are under the influence of that substance called alcohol. In other words, that, that means that we, how many of you know people change when they get under the influence of alcohol? Some, some who are quiet become very talkative. Some who may be very nice become very combative. They, their whole personality can change. And they're not, you, you can't believe that's the same person. But wait a minute, then if I can be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then I could do things that normally I would not do. So when somebody says, hey, we, we need you to stand up and give a testimony, you say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, really? Huh? Who do you have? Wh whose, influence, whose influence are you under? See? You influence your influence or you be under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I could never go out and talk to anybody about Jesus. Who, whose influence are you under? You see, the Spirit of God, He wants to have the influence in our life. So we're under His influence. Where, where He has the control of us. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to control you? Or do you still want to have the controls? God, God isn't in the co-pilot seat. God is to be in the pilot seat. And He's to be in control of our life. The Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Romans, that puts the death the deeds of the body, that puts to death the deeds of the flesh. They say, well, I just, I just can't stop this. It, it's some, whether, and by the way, whether it's some addiction or whether it's anger or whether it's, it's gossip or whether it's in any of the other things that sometimes we don't think are so bad sins, you know. Because they're not as outward as somebody who's smoking or drinking or shooting up with drugs or something like that. But listen, the, the worrying and the gossiping and the anger and the jealousy, and the envy, and the covetousness, that's just as wicked in the sight of God. Okay? And how do you get victory over that? Well, you get victory over that by the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one called alongside to help. God, God never said you're going to live the Christian life by trying harder. You live the Christian life by yielding more. By surrendering to the Spirit of God. It's 
It's the power that raised up Jesus from the dead. He lives inside of us. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And He'll give you the victory. The Holy Spirit gives us victory over the flesh. The Holy Spirit opens our understanding of the Bible. Well, see, people who say, you know, I need, I need a Bible that's easier to read. I don't understand it. Your problem isn't easier reading words. Your problem is, ask the Holy Spirit to open your understanding. You have the author of the book living inside of you. So ask him to help you understand his word. Do you think God wants you to know his word? Does he want you to understand his word? Well, sure. So is he going to make it hard for you? No, he's not. He's going to help you. I, I, I get on the people in RU all the time because we have folks who, and because sometimes because of their past, they say, I just can't, mem- I can't memorize anything, you know. I can't memorize all these verses. And, and I always look at them and I say, well, it's too bad God wouldn't help you. Too bad there's nobody who would help you do that. No. And you know what? We don't think about, why don't I ask God to help me with this? Why don't I ask the Holy Spirit to help me to mem- memorize? Does, hey, does he want you to memorize his word? Would he like you to hide his word in your heart? Would he like you to meditate upon his word? Absolutely. Uh, too bad he wouldn't help you do that. Absolutely he will. So will you let the Holy Spirit have influence in your life? He'll mortify the deeds of the flesh. He'll open up your understanding of the Bible. He'll pull down the strongholds of wrong thinking and, and in your life. I talked to several people just this past week that said, man, I've, my thinking's changed so much on, it was a subject of homosexuality. And, 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 and th- those areas, of my, my thinking's changed so much on that since I've been saved. Since I've been coming to church, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. God begins to change our thinking. Your living never changes till your thinking changes. Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit produces His fruit in my life. Holy Spirit, all you have to do to get the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all you need to do to get that in your life is yield to Him. You don't try harder. I just have to work harder at being long-suffering. No, 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 no. It's not in your power. It's in His power. We yield to the Spirit of God and say, Spirit of God, I yield to you. You put to death my members today. You you control my thinking today. I want to live under the influence today. The influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Everybody, Everybody who's a believer has the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit of God. And he's there to guide you and direct you. The Bible's Jesus said, he'll bring all things to your remembrance, what I've taught you. Who, who helps you to remember what the Lord's taught you? The Holy Spirit does. So ask him to help you. Ask him to influence you. Someone said, if you do not like the crop you're reaping, change the seed you're sowing. If you don't like the crop you're reaping, change the seed you're sowing. They that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. They that sow the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So sow to the Spirit, not to the flesh. So we let the Holy Spirit be an influence in our life. How sad it is that most Christians go days and weeks and months and never ever talk to the Holy Spirit. Never ever consciously yield yourself to Him. Never consciously ask for His help when He's there to help. He's there to be the prayer partner. He's there to intercede for us. He's there to empower us. He's there to to be our help. And we don't call on Him. Allow Him to be an influence in your life. Secondly, besides the Spirit of God, allow the church of God to be an influence in your life. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, would you please? Familiar verses, but I'd like you to look at it. Hebrews chapter 10, talking about influence. Hebrews chapter 10. Notice verse number 23. Where the writer of Hebrews writes this, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without what? Wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Well, how do we do that? There's not a period at the end of that verse, is there? 
No, he's still, still holding that thought. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of son is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We gather together to exhort unto love and good works, to provoke others to love and good work. You know what that is? The church having influence in your life. The gathering together of the saints has an influence. Just how Lot was blessed, as long as under Abraham's influence, I want to be around people that will influence me to love God. I'm going to be around people that will influence me to serve the Lord. I'm going to be around people who influence me to love other people. Because those who love God are going to influence me to love God and going to help me to love God. And those are the people I want to be around. Now remember, Hebrews here, he's writing to people who, who were uh, grappling a little bit with their faith. That's why he said in verse 23, let's hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. Oh, some people were getting shaky on their profession of faith. One of the reasons they got shaky on their profession of faith was they weren't gathering together with other believers. Didn't Peter? Peter got real shaky with his faith, didn't he? When he wasn't around other believers. Boy, there's a strength that comes from being in church and being around the people of God. And so they were habitually forsaking the meetings of the church. That's not a new thing. That was happening way back here with these Christians. And so Paul had to exhort them to not forsake the assembly. Church attendance has a lot to do with holding fast your profession without wavering. It has a lot to do with, with exhorting others to love and good works. It has a lot to do with uh, people not getting discouraged in their Christian life. A lot of times people are discouraged and when you talk talking to them and you find out it's because they've been very sporadic with church. Very sporadic being around the people of God. Those are discouraged people. I can't tell you how many times that people come during the week and they have a problem or they have something they're discouraged about and you know what I end up having to teach them? I have to teach them what I just taught on Sunday but they weren't in church to hear it. Had they just been faithful to the house of God they would have got what they needed to face the problem they're dealing with. The other night, I think it was Brother Gary who said so many times they've come in and, and, and exactly what they're dealing with or exactly a problem they have, that's exactly what the message is about. That's God, see? That's God knowing what they need. And, and that's the, 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 the beauty of allowing the church to be an influence in your life. Peter, you didn't get to read it there in Matthew, but the Bible says what, what happened was he followed Jesus afar off. Oh, he didn't. I'm not. Uh, how many times have I heard people say when they're not in church, oh, no, no, I'm still, I'm still right with God, preacher. Huh? Right away, get defensive. Oh, no, 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 I'm not forsaking the Lord. I'm not doing that. I'm still okay with God. No, but what you're doing is you're following, but you're following afar off. That's a dangerous place to be. Ask Peter. That's a dangerous place to go. Let the church be an influence in your life. Let the Spirit of God influence your life. Let the church of God influence your life. Thirdly, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Notice with me verse number 16. Notice where Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, what's the rest of the verse say, church? Be ye followers of me. Turn over a few pages to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians and verse 1. What does Paul say again here in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1? He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Can I say this? Allow the man of God to be an influence in your life. Allow the man of God to be an influence in your life. Allow the pastor who follows Christ to be an influence in your life. There's a fellow named Dan who we went to 
Christian college together. I left that college and finished at Howes Anderson College for two years and graduated there, but he, we went out after graduation from college and planted a church in Arizona. Dan went and worked for his father, who was a pastor of an independent Baptist church up in Michigan. I guess there is one up there. And um, we got word, he contacted us, that they were leaving his father's church to go start a church in California. They were going to stop in and visit with us. We had been good friends, good buddies in college, and his uh, wife now was his girlfriend then, and my wife and I, and uh, we had spent time together, and so they wanted to stop in and see us. And I, I got... I got so, it was real kind of uneasy as they came. And I began to ask him about his church that he was going to begin. Because he, he wouldn't tell me the name of his church. What are you going to call your church? Well, and he'd go on to something else. He was just avoiding the question. And finally I said, you're not starting a Baptist church, are you? He said, it was something, something, church that you couldn't tell what, what it would be or what they would believe? No. I said, no King James Bible? He said, no. Not a Baptist church. No, no separation, no standards. And I, and I thought, you know, we just, just six years before, seven years before, we were both right here. And, and I was still right here. How did you get all the way over here? Uh, and, and you know what he told me? The books I've read, the people I've listened to, the conferences I've attended. And it's influenced him. He told me, he said, I had a book that I read seven years ago and, and, and I wrote comments Ha ha, laughing at the, what the writer wrote. He said, I read the same book recently and I'm laughing at my comments instead of laughing at the text. Influence. Who he allowed to influence him. The, another fellow years ago named Mike was in our church, reached and baptized by our church got caught up with some others in the church who, it's another story, but long story short, they were leaving our church and he decided he'd go as well. I begged him not to go. Mike had become such a faithful soul winner. He and his wife, uh, uh, Millie, would come every, every Thursday night, Thursday night in those days for the soul winning night. And, and it was not unusual to have 40 or 50 people out soul winning on Thursday night. And they were, they were faithful, and, and they uh, kind of had a, a little friendly competition sometimes about who, if, she, if he had somebody saved and she didn't, or, you know, the other way, and they kind of had fun with that. But they, they, they were just growing in the Lord and begun to teach some Sunday school classes and such, and uh, just, a, just a wonderful young couple. And I begged him not to go. I said, Mike, you, you won't keep being a soul winner if you leave the environment that everyone's doing that. It's very difficult to continue that when you're not under that influence. No, no, I'll always, you know, I'm always going to do that. I'm going to... I said, okay. But nine months later, he knocked on my door, invited him in, and he said, I just need to stop in and tell you you were right. He said, in nine months... I've only had two people I've led to the Lord. said, I'm not the soul winner that I was. What happened? Influence. Influence. I remember one Sunday I brought a sermon. Let's see, it was 1988. Is that 30 years ago almost? Wow, 29 years ago. So I was... I was all of 30 years of age. And I, uh, that, that, that passage in Timothy, they that will be rich 
how they err from the faith and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And I brought a message on that, how the, the goal in life for a believer is not to be rich. Amen. Okay? That's not the goal. At that time, we had a fellow in the church, and, and, and I, I think he probably was maybe 60, probably twice my age. And he was big with a company called A.L. Williams. Anybody remember that, that name? A.L. Williams, you know, it was, the big thing was uh, you don't have whole life insurance. You buy term life insurance and invest it because it's much cheaper. And instead of spending $100 a month on a whole policy, you spend $20 a month and you invest the difference in investments and that, that grows much better than, anyway, that was his idea. And he had come to me and he had wanted me to, if I, fi- if I counseled couples in the church to, you know, if I could recommend them to see him, he could set them up. And then he would, you know, kick me back some money. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Now, can you imagine if people find out that, oh, yeah, pastor says go see him. Well, you know, your guy gives them money for, you know, what? You know, I said, no, no, I can't do that. Then he tried to get me to join with him in A.L. Williams. Took me to a meeting, and we saw videos of all these preachers that, that sold insurance, too, and uh, did that on the side. And I said, man, I just, I said, I just have a hard time knocking on doors in the community saying, hi, I'm Stan Slayball with A.L. Williams. I said, I just feel like I'm Pastor Slayball with and the name of the church. That, that's, that's who I am. I said, so I can't do that. Well, when I... The whole goal of that thing, of them being in that, is financial independence. Your goal is to be financially independent. Okay? So obviously when I brought that message that morning, that didn't sit well. When I got done and walked to my office, he was waiting at my office door. And he let me know that he was twice as old as I was. And that something about I was still wet behind my ears and didn't know what I was talking about and just just let me have it undressed me pretty good and let me know he was leaving the church the sad thing is but by the way all that is A.L. Williams had more influence on him than his pastor did you understand he had more influence than what he allowed his pastor to have the sad thing is, again, he had a grown daughter and a husband, and they left the church when he did. And within three years, tragically, they were divorced. And their marriage had fallen apart. You see, you, you just don't know the influence. We had another family. Boy, I tell these stories, you think everybody we ever had left the church, you know, but um, had a family that read a book on child rearing. And the author in that book, and it was a famous radio preacher, famous preacher that would be known if I said his name, and he wrote that book and he said, you ought to give your child a choice about going to the dance or not. You ought to give your child a choice about going to the rock concert or not. That you don't want to influence their, their, their religion. You, you need to give them the choice. And let them decide for themselves. And they took that famous author and famous pastor over their pastor. And decided they would take their influence and they left. You see, and and by the way, I don't understand that. yet. How can you not want to influence your children? How can you not want to be the right influence for them? I mean... The, the Internet's going to influence them. Television's going to influence them. The public school's going to influence them. The, the, uh, their friends are going to influence them. Everybody else is putting their influence on them. Mom and Dad, you better put your influence on them. If, if they're just supposed to decide everything for themselves, why did God give them parents? Why did God put you in the picture? Why did He say, children, obey your parents in the Lord if you don't ever give them anything to obey. If all you do is give them choices. No, you're supposed to give them commandments. Keep them.
I hurt sometimes for people in our church who listen to the pastor preach but don't allow him to have influence in their life. I've, you've heard me say it before. There are people who look up at the pastor and they say, there's the pastor of the church. There's others of you in the room that look up and they say, there's my pastor. And that means you're allowing the pastor to have influence in your life. He's your pastor. There's a difference. Sometimes people hear the truth and you think, well, that's what the pastor thinks. Well, I know pastor said this, but I heard Dr. Phil say this. <laughs> uh, the pastor said this, but, you know, Dr. Oz was on the other day and, uh, and we hear them. And, and we say that, but sometimes that, that, that's very true. Do you allow... Do you allow the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the man of God to be an influence in your life? Oh, what a difference it makes. I was 18 years old, and I was training to work in the airline and travel industry. I had taken some schooling, and part of the end of that schooling to graduate was you had to at that time we flew down to what was love field in those days before they built the big metroplex there in dallas for the airport we trained at love field it was the home of braniff airlines i don't know if you remember that airline or not it goes back a few years and we would be there for three weeks to train on their computers at the terminal and they, they put us up. It was a two-bedroom apartment and two beds in each room, so four guys in an apartment. And they set us up down there. And I remember walking in and first time really in my life at 18 uh, that I'd been away from home, especially five, 600 miles, whatever it is from Canton, Ohio to Dallas, Texas. And I walked in and there was a group of, you remember now this is the, this is the 1976, okay? And a group of people in a circle and, you know, long hair. One guy had a guitar. They are singing. And I walked in and there was smoke in the room and I just put my luggage back in my room and they asked me if I wanted to, you know, sit down. No, I'm, I'm good. And then they were passing around a, a cigarette. I found out it wasn't a cigarette. It was... Uh, what do they call that, marijuana joint? They were passing that around, and I said, no thanks. And I, I walked out of the apartment and went down the stairs to the swimming pool because they had a pay phone there. Now, for you young people. <laughs> <laughs> Got to explain what that is, probably, you know. You used to have this thing on a wall, and it had a little place you put dimes in, or quarters, and you would have to pay to call somebody. And I went down there and put some money in, and I called my dad. I called home and talked to my dad and asked him what I should do. He talked to me, and we went on through that three-week period where every night they asked me to go, to, after every, every, every class in the evening, they'd all go to the bar. Come on, go with us to the bar. I'm not going to the bar, guys. I don't do that. No, no, I know. You don't have to drink. Just have a Coke. It's all right. But you know, I, I, the, the verse that came to my mind is what we had in Sunday school today. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, like I think about it, I said, fellas, I said, if somebody walks by and they look in and they see me sitting there with all of you and you have your drinks and I have the same glass there, only I have Coke in mine, they don't know that's Coke. They would just look and assume I'm there and they're drinking with you. I said, I can't do that. And they, they would say, okay. And they went on. Next night, they'd ask me again. and I'd say, no again. Sunday morning, got up and went to church. And everybody else was still sleeping because they were out so late on Saturday night. Most of the time, when church was over and I'd come back in the apartment, they, they would just barely even be up. You see... What happened when I was 18 and what happened, the reason I tell you that story, it was more than just me saying no to marijuana. 
a no to, to going ahead and partying. Hey, I'm 500 miles from home. I'm away for the first time. You know what? I, Mom and dad aren't going to know what I do. I can do whatever. If I want to go my own path and, and go a different route, here's my chance. So what I did that night, listen, that, that wasn't just no to that situation. I was making a choice of who was going to influence me in my life. That was a choice that was made 41 years ago. And I'll guarantee you, had not made that choice then, I wouldn't be pastoring the church tonight. Wouldn't have happened. And now after 35 years of pastoring, I still, what I, believe, I still believe what I believed 35 years ago. Same salvation, same Savior, same Bible, same standards, same doctrine, same baptism, same Holy Spirit fullness, all of that. Why? Influence. Influence. Will you allow the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the man of God to have influence in your life. It'll determine how you live the rest of your life. I think it'll determine what God will be able to do with your life. It all comes down to influence. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the examples we have in Scripture of influence. Thank you, Lord, for the things you've given to us in our lives that have influenced us through the years. God, thank you for the Spirit of God that you give to us at salvation. To be an influence in our life, thank you for the Word of God. May your Word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May you order our steps according to your Word. Lord, I want to thank you for the men of God that you've put in my life over the years. The wonderful pastors I've had the privilege to be under. Men who truly, I could say, I'll follow them because they follow Christ. And Lord, I pray that each individual here tonight would decide what they're going to allow to influence them, and not just in 2017, but from 2017 and beyond. so we could be what you desire us to be. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many believers tonight would say, Preacher, the, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight about influence. Maybe, maybe he's spoken to your heart about some things you're allowing to have influence in your life that you know you shouldn't. They're not helping you to serve God. They're not helping you love God. And what you need to do is replace them with the things that will help you serve God. Tonight, the Spirit of God has touched your heart about allowing Him to have influence in your life. He's touched your heart about having the Word of God have influence in your life. Maybe He's touched your heart about having the man of God have influence in your life. If you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has dealt with me tonight about influence, what I'm allowing to influence my life, and I want to have the proper influences in my life. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up and say, God spoke to my heart tonight, Pastor? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. You simply obey Him this evening and do what he's telling you to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to arts tonight. Thank you for meeting with us. I pray, Lord, that your will will be done now in these next few moments of invitation. You'll hear our prayers. We bow our knee to you. Lord, we, we desperately want to have the right influences in our life. It, it, it makes us, it shapes us, it helps us to be what you want us to be. Thank you for giving us the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and a man of God in our lives that we can look up to. And I pray, Lord, that by letting these things influence us, that we could be a good influence to others. Have your way now in this invitation, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. 
God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Oh, to be like the right. blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of us treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as a wart. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind, helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as a wart. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, while I am pleading, pour out thy spirit, fill with thy love. Make me a temple, meet for thy dwelling, fit me for life and heaven above. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Look this way for a minute, if you would. Remember, now Tuesday, uh, Brother Moreland has some surgery on Tuesday, and so pray for him, just outpatient. But uh, you pray for Brother Ron, if you would, on Tuesday. No, we appreciate that. Brother Linky has a, a test he's taken, civil service test, on uh, 3 o'clock on Tuesday. So please remember him in prayer. He'll have good recollection of what he's studied, and he'll be able to do well on that. Uh, opportunity for a, a, a real good job opportunity for him so let's pray for that <clears throat> pray for the pastors conference in india that'll start wednesday and uh, be praying for brother yoder brother fowler for the work there that god's doing all right and ladies don't forget those of you going to the uh, ladies retreat you have a meeting down in the conference room after we're done with the service tonight okay let's pray together shall we father thank you for today and thank you lord for a wonderful lord's day well, it's been good to be in the house of the lord uh, thank you for faithful people who love you and are in their place Sunday morning and Sunday night. Lord, thank you for the decisions that were made today. Thank you for Mimi and for Nicodemus and uh, joining in the fellowship with our church. I pray, Lord, that will be a, a, a blessing and encouragement to them as they seek to live for you. Lord, thank you for decisions that have been made in our hearts today because we were in church. Thank you for a church that will provoke one another to love and to good works. Father, we love you, we love what you're doing in our church, and we pray that you'll continue to work in each one of our lives. Make us mindful now that you go with us from this place. Lord, help us to please you in all we do this week. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's sing it one more time together. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>